your logo with like your profile picture. <laughs> you couldn't actually see what the PowerPoint was and it really? didn't have the webcam. So you just kind of ran with the audio. Yeah. I'm sorry. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's a thumbnail of the video was fine. Well, like you yeah. click on it, it's just the profile picture. You're kidding me. No. To the picture of Ed Bodelock? <laughs> the guy in the, with the mustache? I think that was you, yeah. <laughs> that, wait, that isn't you? No, that isn't me. That's Ed Farlock. Did he tell us it was in the studio? I actually thought that was in the studio. Yeah! yeah. So, so, I, don't I, don't I, know, I know my nose is fairly big, but Ed's nose is really big. Alright, so, 516 to 517 uh, in the review. I'm sorry about that. I, <laughs> but there are six multiple trucks. And we have to get used to the style they write in standardized tests. Yes, the ACT is like that. But they're written in such a vague, generic way that they're really open ended. So we just got to get used to the style. So I'm going to start giving you a few questions and I'll give you a few points of credit for doing it. You will turn this in. I was going to make it on Teams and just like turn in a picture and put it in. But Teams won't do assignments now for whatever reason. It might come back, it might not. We'll see. And so. The way they do it on AP exams is they give you a stimulus, some kind of either a paragraph, a, a political cartoon, a graph, something to stimulate your memory of that era. So in a way that's good, but, it all, um, but sometimes it, um, they can make it even more narrow. But so just read this as a point of it's, it's triggering memory. The, you can ask three questions. The first one might kind of be directly related, but the other two are more like your knowledge of that area or that era stimulated by the stimulus question. And so there are two little short paragraphs, three questions for each. I want you to do the questions and then when you're done, I will post it in the regular chat for all the periods, the third period or fourth period on Teams, I'll have to keep. So grade, grade your own after and look at it. And then you'll just turn in like a half sheet of paper tomorrow or Wednesday with the uh, six. Sound good? I'll give you a few points for it. I'm rewarding you for doing a little practice. The other thing you need to do is on page 519, short answer questions. Remember, remember the short answer questions are those like three, um, three sentence short IDs. Remember those, we've done those. So these are three examples of short answer questions. I just want you to look at them. Think how you would answer. Just think how you would answer one to you know, what you would ID for each one of those. And get used to how they write. And that's always one of the problems. There are certain things I want on test. And you're getting used to my style. You have to start thinking about other styles or other styles. So I what we gotta do. Sound good? So please do that. We'll do a few more. And so let's get back to, we got election of 36 done, right? Roosevelt being elected. We got wealth tax, WPA, um, white draft. I'm sorry that didn't work. God, that really annoys me. But the little, we tried, I showed a little video clip, that worked. So you only have audio. Did I sound good? <laughs> Comparatively, that's implying it might sound bad sometimes, but that's really weird. That would be annoying. I must have, but I'm positive I did. You know, I'm trying to set it up. I must not have. Did the little, no video at all show it? Because if I don't share my screen, it should just be the front of the classroom. I just saw the profile picture. Like, um, no, I believe you. No, I so. if, if you don't share, my, share the screen, it should show in front of my class with the camera. So that's why I'm just, I'm just really, I'm just really weird. What do you are? I think everyone's out to get us. Is that probably? Yeah, that's not Yeah, have you noticed that? I'm, we're not being paranoid. Just everyone's out to get us. watching whenever the light turns green or red or, or or it's not flashing they're watching 
<laughs> so did we get the core packing? So, okay, we got the WPA, the Well Tax Act, which had a marginal income tax rates, the um, Social Security, and um, those are the, the big parts of the Second New Deal. What was it called for the gap between the rich and the poor shrunk? Yeah, the Great Compression. Now, it's the only time in history that has happened. In fact, a lot of people say, when they look back to the 1950s and 60s, a lot of people to this day kind of look back, and that's what, we go back to those good old days in America. That was an aberration. It's usually the gap between the rich and the poor in American history has been expanding. Now it's just accelerating beyond human comprehension. So we got the core package. Did we get to this? Did we get to this? So Roosevelt's plan was to appoint up to six justices. It's a very complex thing about one judge for every judge over 70. Just think about six. Well, this cartoon shows the uproar this would cause. Just like a massive chaos. Even though the Constitution is very clear. Congress creates the court system. They decided nine justices back in 1870. And Roosevelt, maybe correctly, has said... The country's a lot bigger. The country's a lot bigger now than the 1870s, and we still only have nine justices in the Supreme Court. And immediately, the call was, Roosevelt wants to be a dictator. So here are the nine justices, and here are the six new ones, implying they'll all be a bunch of FDR clones. Now, that's, of course, implying that every justice appointed by the president will be a clone. Which, no. But that would be close. I mean, you're going to imagine the justices appointed by President Trump are going to be a lot different than the justices appointed by President Biden, let's say. But anyways, a lot of Roosevelt supporters in Congress said conservative Southern Democrats are just looking for a way to go on the issue. And if you ask for six, they'll turn against you. But Roosevelt believed after his massive landslide slide victory, nobody would ever go back against him. And remember what he wanted. He wanted health insurance, education, and civil rights. You know, that was his goal, those three things. And by the way, remember this victory? He thought, and some of you could only hear about it. <laughs> that makes me mad. So let's get back to this. So. He still pushed it through Congress. And what happened? His first major defeat. A coalition of mostly Southern Democrats and Republicans killed it in Congress. It didn't pass. And now they smell blood. For the first time, Roosevelt could be beaten. And conservative Democrats could go away from it. Not just all Southerners. And all Republic, almost all Republicans. There were a lot of liberal Republicans back then. When I mean liberal or conservative, I'm talking purely in the context of the New Deal. So a couple things are going to come out of this. First off, the court was kind of cow. They got a more liberal Supreme Court. Roosevelt picked a couple more members. They did approve the Wagner Act and Social Security. But Roosevelt suffered a defeat he could never remember. He can lose. And once that came about, his other programs are vulnerable. Even though the vast majority of people wanted them, a consortium of politicians, representing usually very wealthy financiers or big farmers, is the deal. So the Wagner Act Social Security was upheld. So it's one of those things where, yeah, so the New Deal mostly survived. But a couple more things are going to happen, partially because of this disaster. Roosevelt, worrying about the federal deficit, would begin a series of acts that would lead to the Roosevelt recession. Now, let me be very clear about something. You don't want recessions named after you. you know, I would not want the Partridge disaster because they might remember you poorly. So Roosevelt got a lot of credit for his program, and then he's going to run into this kind of revolt of people against them, but against the wrongs. What happened was this. Roosevelt thought the Depression was over. 
and yet there is raising, rising federal debt, rising federal debt. So we decided to balance the budget, to cut the deficit, cut spending. Now it's time to pay back its debt. A lot of his advisors and allies in Congress said, we're not out of it yet. Don't cut spending. But Roosevelt, thought he might get allies that were more conservative. He joined conservatives in the Democratic and Republican Party to vote for government spending, a.k.a. austerity. The big one was they cut spending of the WPA. And what happened? They pulled that money out of the economy and demand tanked. And when demand tanked, another recession. So here's the dropping unemployment of the second New Deal. And here's the rising unemployment of Roosevelt's cuts. This was a political disaster. Roosevelt never recovered from the twin disasters of court packing and the Roosevelt recession. Terrible political move. Whether you believe that they should have cut spending or not, the point is for Roosevelt, it was a disaster. The same thing happened in your lifetime. There was massive cutback in government spending in 2010. The economy never really fully recovered from the depression that started in 2008 for a really long time. And it hammered President Obama, who won a pretty big victory in 2008, and the Democrats were hammered in 2010. The, the Democrats here will be hammered in, two, in 1938. And that's when Roosevelt decided to heck with the deficit, or as somebody said, deficit, smash up it. I can't even say it now. We're going to spend money. Spend, spend, spend. The heck with the deficit. Deficit. I can't even say it now. Schmeficit. Yeah, somebody said that. I always thought that made me laugh. So with that, and they're going to adopt a form of economics that was really being kind of created in this era. Liberal economics are named after its founder, Keynesian economics. John Maynard Keynes and Keynesian economics. So we got to have a little bit of economics talk now. Economics. So Keynesian, we just wrote it, Keynesian economics. And it's named after John Maynard Keynes, an English economist best known for warning about reparations after World War I. There's Keynes right there, reading a book, Great Mustache. And what he said was this. He warned about something I mentioned before, debt deflation. If everybody tries to pay back their debt at the same time, that makes the recession worse. That makes, I'm sorry, that drops demand, makes things worse. Nobody is spending money. But who can spend money? The government. The government must borrow, AKA deficit spending, to make up the difference in demand. If people aren't spending money, government will borrow that money that's just sitting idle and spend it. That will increase demand. How do you do that? Well, the big one is build roads or whatever it might be. Just get the money out there to increase demand. Worry about the deficit when times are good. It's easy to pay back debt when you're making money. It's hard when you're not. And the government does not have the same constraints as people. They just don't. They create the money, they have taxes, and they have an army who enforces laws. It's different. He begged Roosevelt in 37, don't cut spending. Did you spell it? No. Don't cut spending. He begged him to spend more. You're not spending enough. Increase the WPA, but Roosevelt didn't listen. After 37, Roosevelt listened, and they greatly expanded the WPA. But that's going to lead to, oh, only two countries followed Keynes' prescription. Only two. This was back in 32. He's telling everybody, spend, 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 spend. Most countries went to austerity. In 1932, one of those countries was Sweden. And Sweden got out of the Depression really fast. Anybody know the other country that began it? In 1933. Germany. Now, Germany didn't do the other program, maybe Democratic elements of it, but they started doing things like 
building all these dams and hydroelectric plants and buildings and homes for people. And of course, there's Hitler starting construction on this amazing highway system that Germany would build. What is that highway system called? The Autobahn, which all freeways copy to this day. All were part of this get people back to work. Germany didn't really start rearming until 35, 36, after, after unemployment was pretty much down to zero. Oh, sure, they had a big debt, but we'll pay that back later or go to war. That's another story. I should add, Keynes did not like to brag about the fact that Nazi Germany was using at least part of his program. That's not something he put on a resume. So let's get to what Keynesian economics is. So remember trickle down? I drew it for you as put money in your hands of very wealthy and it kind of went down. Do you remember that program? So this one's going to go from the bottom up. So we need a little bit of space on the bottom because his idea was the vast mass of people were wage earners, working class people. And what we got to do is government aid directly to them. And what we got to do, put money into their hands. Now we'll talk about how the government would do that in just a second. So we'll have something to show how the money will get there. I'll show you the government aid. If you put money into people's hands, especially people who don't have money, that increases demand. They will start spending money. And production will go up. So demand will create, and you should probably write this down, supply. This is what supply for production. Companies will start producing things. Eventually, what will these companies need? Employment, they'll start hiring workers. And what will that do? More money into workers' hands. So down to here. And that is the engine of Keynesian economics. Now remember, the engine of trickle-down was get money to the hands of the very wealthy, they'll build factories, and then that will create demand for more money in the wealthy hand. Here, it's money into workers, demand, production, more money in their hands. So this is more broad-based. And one very important thing about this, they do not, Keynesian economics does not have the social Darwinistic idea that some people are more deserving for money. And poor people, working people who are unemployed are somehow inferior. No, they're workers who are laid off. How can you make a moral judgment like that? And so that's the engine. So this is liberal or demand side economics. And for some reason, I typed in demand side twice. I don't know why I did that. So trickle down is supply side. So if somebody believes in conservative economics, if somebody says, I am a conservative today, they believe in conservative economics, trickle down on the money in the hands of the wealthy. If somebody believes in liberal economics or demand side or Keynesian, this is what they believe. And the whole idea is we're helping the people buying the goods, not the suppliers, the buyers. Now, this could be good and bad because people might forget that we're all working together as workers, but still, money in their hands. Now, this might cause problems. If we have a lot of consumers who are buying goods, what might that do to prices? Yeah, raise prices. One more big thing. Part of this plan was, and this fits in with the New Deal idea of raising the middle class. If there's more people who consider themselves middle class, that will strengthen the, strengthen the nation in so many ways. Now, first off, let's remember what middle class is. Middle class means people who must work, but they can afford some of the trappings of an upper class life. And what the goal is to have more people to have at least a taste of that upper class life. Okay, what was that upper class life? Let's get to the basics. You own your own home. I have a chance to. And by the 1950s, you have a car. 1950s, TV. Washer and dryer. Take better life for your children. That became what a middle class life is. And so many people, when they think of the United States today, they think of that world that was created out of the New Deal, not middle class. The 50s and 60s lifestyle. And if you have people who are benefiting from society, they'll be less likely to revolt. And here's what you have to get, jot this down for the middle class. If more people feel like they're middle class, there's less chance for less chance of fascism or communism. 
That's what they're thinking. All of Western Europe and Japan will adopt Keynesian economics to keep out the fascists. When people feel part of the system, the less and though they're benefiting, they feel tomorrow will be, will be better, they'll be less likely to revolt. People will feel disconnected from the government and society and, and feel potential um, feel hopelessness and tomorrow might be worse. That's how fascism can grow. I don't have any doubt, but it's a truism. With the middle class shrinking all over, that's why there's a growth of fascism right now. Fascism is growing, which is, um, I was kind of hoping I'd never have to say that. Yes, fascism is on the rise, big time. The Great Compression is a classic example of this, the gap between the rich and the poor shrunk. The Great Compression happened all over Western Europe and all in Japan, to the point where now, if you go to places like Germany, they are much more, um, have a much more equal society compared to wealth in the United States now. And it was not at all like that before. I meant Germany after World War II. So what's the government aid? What is the government aid to pump money into workers' hands? Now, some of this is direct aid, but all has one basic goal. So what is it first off? Progressive taxes. So that 79% highest marginal income tax rate and a tax on big wealth, which never really happened here, but a little bit with the states, that raises wages. That makes it harder to accumulate vast fortunes and make sure the wealth is spread out all over. You could say that's a bad thing if you believe in conservative economics. Next, pro-union. The Wagner Act, unions raise wages. Government regulation. And the two biggies, the financial regulation kept bubbles, speculation, from happening and antitrust. Next, those things are called the safety net that conservative economics is opposed to. Now, we've talked about these before, but things like some we have now, unemployment insurance. There's a little bit of aid for the poor. During the New Deal, they tried FARA. That's gone now. There's very little aid for the poor now in the United States. The only real direct aid are food stamps, sometimes you see them called SNAP. And that was originally done to help farmers get higher prices so people could afford them. Now it's a little bit of direct aid. Social Security, an old age pension. Small, but there. Public works. Build roads and bridges, thus the picture of Work Pays America WPA. I always like this one, except for the, free, the creepy, uh, no lines on their face. They look very scary, but I always like that picture. Now, there's a line through it that didn't work as well as I thought, but health insurance, that didn't happen in the United States. How in Britain, France, Germany, they have national health insurance. That didn't happen there. So that, we have that added layer of inse insecurity in the United States. During the last gasp of the New Deal in the 1960s with John Kennedy and, and Lyndon Johnson, there would be health insurance for the elderly and for some people of lower incomes, but that still only affects, or that does not affect most working people or families. Most people, they lose their job, they lose their health insurance, which makes it pretty scary to lose your job. And also education, that only partially happened. <coughs> There'd be a little aid for education, but there wasn't like the free tuition for public universities. Aid is still limited. You know, what's the first budget they cut in every state is education. They cut some education in Montana last year, and they're really going to cut education next year. Just, just telling you what's going to come. But the whole reason for this was to raise wages. The whole reason all of these raise wages. Every single one of these will put more money into workers' hands. And so this is why it's the exact opposite of trickle-down economics. Remember, trickle-down economics is to funnel money to the hands of the wealth. So what do we get out of this? Well, there's a challenges with this. Every economic program, and this is a different way to say capitalism, 
There are things that can happen. If everybody is, if the whole goal is to put money in people's hands, if everybody's trying to buy a limited number of products, you'll get inflation. But the Federal Reserve can raise interest rates to curtail, curtail inflation, or they can raise taxes. So Keynes has a way built in to stop this. The problem is no politician wants to raise taxes. And the Federal Reserve raising interest rates is pretty ham-handed. If they raise interest rates, that could, uh, I mean, the goal is to slow the economy down, which might lead to a recession. I can still vividly remember the 1980s, early 80s, when the Federal Reserve raised interest rates to over 20%. To give you an idea, they just raised that rate to uh, 0.5 last week, or two weeks ago. That should give you an idea how high interest rates were. And that led to a horrible economic recession. 11 percent on a point so it's pretty ham hand and so this it works but it can be difficult next if you're going to increase government spending in bad times you're going to have debt but in good times spending drops and you can raise taxes in good times to curtail the debt it's happening right now in 2020, the, de the federal deficit was just exploding because of the pandemic and the depression that caused. Now, the deficit is shrinking really fast because we have really good economic times. We have the best job numbers in American history. Well, the best since 1968. Right now. That's giving you an idea how just things are booming. And I'm pretty sure I'm the only one in this classroom who was alive in 1968. I don't know for most of you, I wasn't around, but I'm probably the only one. Well, so you guys don't remember the heady days of 1960, right? <laughs> I was in Miles City. So moving on. Also, government power will go up. There'll be a lot, and the president especially. But what the Keynesians said, hey, we'll make sure that people are involved in democracy. So people's voices will be heard. And this really did kind of happen up through the 1960s and then into the 60s. I mean, the whole thing just started blowing up. Yes, I know I was around, but it wasn't all my fault. Also, because of social Darwinism, a lot of people thought this direct government aid called welfare was going to go to undeserving people, implying that some people are going to get more wealth than others. And I'm always fascinated by this because the same people thought that direct government aid to very wealthy people was perfectly fine. But the whole idea of social Darwinism is if you're wealthy, you're a good person. If you're poor, you're a bad person. And so that there's no direct way around this. If you believe that, you believe that. But that's why Social Security goes to all workers. And that's why Roosevelt wanted health insurance for everybody. And so they can't take it away. Everybody gets it. Social Security is never going away, probably, because everybody gets it, as long as you work. I'm thinking about that now. We we're just talking about retiring. I was just talking about a couple of teachers retiring today. Hey, I was around in 68. Do the math. Next, conservatives hated Keynes, and they're going to try everything they can to get, to get the tax rates down and to get rid of the regulations so they could start funneling money, money to the top, because that's what they want to do for all kinds of reasons. And when things began to blow up in the 1970s, that when they would get their chance. So with that, a couple more things real quick. While this is all going on, we have to do very quickly about the growth of labor. Because labor unions were also expanding at this time, too. The NRA would allow for labor unions. So we talked about this before in class. So this is a review. The Wagner Act would allow it. And the election of 1936 showed the power of workers. Roosevelt was elected with workers backing. So he supported them. But there's a union we need to know. It broke off from the AFL, and it's called the CIO. It's an industrial union. It's called the Congress of Industrial Organization. You don't need to know that. Just know it's an industrial union. 
the CIO under John L. Lewis of the United Mine Workers. I was going to show you a couple minute video clip of John L. Lewis, but as you can see, it's not working. I tried to find the copy of it and I can't find it, so I'm going to have to load it up again. Because I have the copy at home, I just upload on, on the YouTube. But I love this. It says that the account of this video has been terminated. Wow. So you wonder about the power of monopolies. Google just now terminated people. It's a brave new world, people. But they began to, um, why did I forget an O here? What was that? I was trying to save space. I'm tired of those. So beginning at 36 after the election, a wave of strikes that are now illegal called sit-down strikes. The first one being the winter of 36-37 at the Flint, Michigan GM plant, where workers literally sat down on the assembly line. As you can see right here, they're sitting on car seats. I love that picture. And they won't let the factory go, demanding a contract for all workers. And eventually, GM broke down. They couldn't send in their guards to kick out the union because that might destroy the factory. And here's the family members of the um, workers. I love how they got all the kids out front. You know, my daddy's a union man. I love, you know, get the kids out front. So it looks, you know, that's good PR, right? But it's my favorite one. Look at that kid. He's the ring. That kid's running everywhere to this day. Ford intensely anti-union and anti-worker, but they too, after a long fight, would recognize the union. And this would trigger a wave of strikes and victories for workers. And union membership went up. And with that, wages went up. Almost 40% of all workers would be in a union by then. If I can get the union, if I can get the video to work, I'll just show you a couple minute clip because I have to show you John Elwood's. He is such a memorable character. I'm always distrustful when they throw kids up in the front with signs, but it's still kind of like that. You know, the kids aren't making up their own mind. Yeah, except for that kid. So with that, we're jumping to terminated. Everyone apologize to our robot overlords. Okay, so with that, at the same time, this would be the worst ecological disaster in American history. A horrific drought called the Dust Bowl. That's where you get the term off of the dirty, dirty. We just need to add to the misery. Because of poor farming techniques, overproduction, and then drought, entire farms blew away in the high winds of the winter of 36, 37. And this is covered with a foot of dust in Oklahoma. The first major soil conservation law in American history, the members of Congress would be debating as dust sprinkled in, into the floor of the United States House. The sun was blocked out all over Europe because of dust from the U.S. Great Plains. That's how bad it was. And we haven't got back to this yet, but as I'm saying this, we are right now in a record drought. So please snow a few feet, except for my sidewalks. I really don't want to shovel, so just leave that. But then every place else. So this is going to lead to a massive internal migration. We share properties being kicked off the farm, and people kicked off the farm because of the dust bowl. So many left from Oklahoma, they're going to be called Okies. And a lot will go to California. And here's California saying, we don't have the room for you. And so many migrants would move. And this is going to lead to these things. Yeah, Oki, so that generic name, Oki. A lot of people, people let's say, live in LA now. Many of the descendants came with that migration of sharecroppers or Okies. This huge migration of over uh, of millions into California alone. The first rule of soil conservation and the first rule of environmental laws, at least direct besides the Reclamation Act. And we've got to say small farmers. And this would be government policy till 1973. 
Here are Okies on the migration westward. It's just part of this feeling that something has got to be done. People forget how bad the Depression was, especially when things were so good, it seemed, by the 1950s. They forgot how bad it was. And people really forget how bad it was. I'm worried that people might forget how bad, let's say, it was during COVID and not prepare for the next pandemic, which hopefully will at least give us a few days, right? We just have a few days, at least until the next variant arrives. Moving on. So all those laws, though, because of these various factors, health care, education, civil rights, they died in Congress. There's only going to be two more major laws of the New Deal. The second AAA, which would go on until 1973, would provide loans and granaries essentially to store the surplus to protect farmers in case of times of overproduction. So they built granaries all over. And another one was, maybe the most important, the Fair Labor Standards Act. And that would do three big things. Set a minimum wage, which is still very low, but do something about, um, because of the oligopolies and monopolies, wage manipulation. A 40-hour work week enforced by overtime pay and child labor laws. As this, no children over 16 years of age must work. And this cartoon says, they said you could have my job, Dad. The kid coming back because child labor laws raise wages. Now, the New Deal's legacy goes on to this day. But this, these are the last two major laws, and both passed the Supreme Court. But as of right now, there are cases winding their way on all of these to the Supreme Court. And I would not be surprised in the next year or two if these are all thrown out. And so thankfully, I'm with you. I want 10 year olds back in the back. Who's with me? Especially since you're no longer 10, so who cares, right? I'm not kidding about that. It'll probably go back to the states. It's going to happen this year with things like uh, women's rights issues like abortion and privacy. This summer will almost certainly be done. So this is a, it, it, we're coming through big changes just in time for you to really fully enjoy them. And on that happy note, all right, I'm going to go through as much as possible. I'm going to do the AP exam. We're going to do more and more review. We're going to do a couple review tests in class. I'll give you some review tests to do on your own. You have a big review packet too. I'm trying to get the. Uh, somebody already done with the review packet, aren't you? Act like you started. We started it. Just act like you have, okay? Yes. If you haven't, it's worth called a lot. It's worth a million points. Not just in my class, but this will go in your other classes, great too, and your permanent record. So you try to get a job 30 years from now and say, oh, you didn't do well on that review packet. No job for you. You think I'm kidding? See, that'll be my legacy. I'll be long gone by then. But the packet remains. Do they have mint in there too? Oh, it, it, as long as it's chocolate, it's okay. Yeah. Have a good day, everybody. Enjoy your lunch. Enjoy the test. Savor the hours in that room.